The following video is a work of fiction. Any similarities to actual people or events is probably a f***ing coincidence, or the result of a bad trip, or a glitch in the matrix or something. Whatever sounds most plausible to you. The only thing worse than having a job is looking for a job. Girl, please. Money's no object for me. I don't have any. Well, if you don't want my peaches, don't shake my tree. Well, one of them was a lawyer, and the other was a psychologist. Did they ask a lot of questions? Well, I had a statement prepared. <laughs> No, my gosh, it was so big, I could barely fit the whole thing in my mouth. Oh, hang on, I have a call on the other line. Hi, sis. It's my sister. Oh, you know me. I've been busy painting most all day. What? You're kidding. No, no, no. No, 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 not at all. I would love to babysit. Does this mean hubby's over his transphobia? Playoff tickets. No, I got you. No, that's cool. Yeah, I heard you. Yes. Yes. Choking hazards? No, the kitty's nice. Well, I mean, art is in the eye of the beholder. Define objectionable. I used to watch you when I was nine and you were four and you turned out great. Nothing bad ever happened. Oh, come on. It didn't hurt that much. They got it out with the forceps, didn't they? Well, I'm not nine anymore. I'm an adult. Vegetables, gotcha. No, I've got plenty, I'm sure. I've got a fridge full of things. Okay. All right, honey. Okay, I'll see you soon. Victor, say bye to Victor. <laughs> okay, love you. Okay, bye. Kitty, we're gonna babysit. Can you believe it? Well, I need something I can babysit in, and this simply won't do it all. <laughs> Here we go. I am so excited to babysit. I've been wanting to babysit for such a long time. I get along so well with children. I've offered to babysit for all of my friends. I've even offered to do so for free, but none of them have taken me up on it. You know, I'm very nurturing by nature and I don't really have an outlet to fulfill this need I have. I hope they get here soon. Seems like it's been a really long time. I think I'm starting to grow a beard. And I've had electrolysis. Oh my gosh, I think that's them. Yay! Oh, well, come right in, I guess. <laughs> oh, no, there's nothing to worry about. I've got it all under control. I know how to take care of kids. It's simple. Like, don't let them get in the sunlight. Um, don't get them wet. Don't feed them after midnight. No, I'm pretty sure that's right. Look, you two just run off. Go to your sporting match thingy. And we'll be fine right here together. Okay, have fun. I'll see you. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Oh, sweetie, you might not want to get too close to that kitty. He can be awfully mean. He's cranky. And more than a little bit, um, bitey. Well, honey, there's nothing over there for you. Come on over here. Yeah, come on over here. I've got things to show you. Other direction, sweetie. There we are. Oh, you want to see what's out the window? Come on, I'll show you what's out the window.
There he is. What's Kitty's name? Oh, it's Victor Newman. Why is he so mean? Um, well, you see, Victor used to be a grown man, just like your father. Except Victor was devastatingly handsome. But he was also treacherous and conniving. You see... Victor got his first wife, Julia, pregnant, but at the time, Julia was seeing Michael Scott. Not, that's what she said, Michael Scott. Different Michael Scott, a photographer. Anywho, Victor found out and locked Michael in a bomb shelter and fed him rats. Ooh. And then another time, Victor hired a Peruvian crime lord to impersonate Jack, while Kelly slowly tortured Jack, and Victor ended up blackmailing Jack and telling everyone that Jack killed Kelly. And then, Victor shoots Jack to try to cover up his tracks. But when that doesn't work, he tried to smother Jack in the hospital. And then, Victor gets Chloe to frame his son Adam for killing Constance. I mean, he helped Adam escape from prison later, but Victor also helped Chloe leave town. And then Skye ends up trying to double-cross Jack, but destroys her own life instead. And then Sky fakes her own death and frames Adam for it, but then Sharon tracks Sky back to Hawaii, and Victor just watches as Sky falls into a volcano. Oh, and remember how Victor had earlier gotten Jeffrey and Gloria to humiliate Colleen to try to ruin her career? Well, Victor winds up getting Colleen's heart when he needed a transplant. I know. See, Colleen was brain dead after trying to escape from this crazy woman, Patty, who was there to terrorize Jack and Phyllis, and then things got out of control. But then Victor tries to stop Sharon and Nick from getting back together, and Victor starts messing with Sharon's bipolar and he hires Mariah, who was a dead ringer for Sharon's daughter Cassie. He hires her to drive Sharon over the edge and insane. <sighs> so finally, your aunt Tracy had had just about enough. So she consulted a forbidden text to summon an ancient spirit who protected her from unspeakable evil just long enough to cast an unbreakable spell, forever turning Victor into a black cat to serve as her familiar until the end of days. Teach you the spell? Oh, Victor. Teach you the spell? Oh, you know, I'd love to, sweetie, but, um, you know, you need Eye of Newton turmeric for that, and I'm, I'm fresh out of both. Okay, okay, look, 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 Comprom look, what if I just, what if I just tell you the magic words that go along with the spell? Yeah? All right, yeah. Um, the magic words, the, the magic words, they are, um, no, no, I got it. Aji Maji La Taraji Wham Bam shang a -ling and a sha la 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 babe. And then you lay it down, flip it, and reverse it. It's her and poof, Victor's a kitty. Oh, no, 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 sweetie, I'm sorry, those aren't for you. No, no, you see, your Aunt Tracy got these to donate for Toys for Tots. Here, I'm sorry, I can't open them so you can play with them. I'll show them to you, though. Would you like to see what we got? We got the Princess of the Mascara. This is Ruby. Yeah, isn't she pretty? This is the green one. This is Jade. Jade really reminds your Aunt Tracy of somebody. I just can't seem to put my finger on who. Duh. I'll tell you what. Do you want to take them down to Toys for Tots with me? All right, yay. Let's go. Field trip. All done. Although I feel like I'm forgetting something. The kid. Oh good. You're still here. <laughs> What's that you have in your mouth? Have you been digging in the trash? Here, let me see that. Well, it's probably fine. I mean, it's mostly saline, right? What's that, sweetie? Well, sure, you can ask me a question. There's no secrets among family. Now, I don't know how it is for other transgender people, but I have come to dread the phrase, can I ask you a question? Because the ensuing question is usually something rather distressing. To me, can I ask you a question ranks right up there with, do you have any idea what time it is, young lady? Or, do you know why I pulled you over? Things you just never want to hear. I always feel a great swell of anxiety every time somebody approaches me and says, can I ask you a question? Story time. Once, a very sweet and well-meaning woman came up to me and completely out of the blue, with no context whatsoever, says, can I ask you a question? 
Are people mean to you? Why, no, my darling. Everyone adores me. Why would you possibly assume anything to the contrary? The problem I have with this is, not only is there the implication that being transgender is somehow burdensome for me, but also, yeah, we weren't talking about that at all. This question came completely out of left field. I really wish people would stop before they ask me something and say to themselves, would I feel comfortable answering this question to a complete stranger? Hop up on the bed. There we go, all settled. Now what's your question, my little nibbling? Why is your bedroom bigger than my entire apartment? <laughs> Good question. Well, you see, sweetie, this is the nicest place Aunt Tracy could afford with the employment she has access to. I don't own this apartment. I have to rent it from the company that does. That's called private ownership. That means someone with plenty of money takes control of products and services and restricts access to it for the rest of us. You see, honey, the thing about private ownership it not only enables the rich, but simultaneously disables the rest of us. Don't they teach you this in school? Haven't you read any Veblen? Who's that? No? What about Bickler and Nietzsche? Three and a half. Okay, fair enough. Listen, honey, you're old enough now to know that our society is built on institutional exclusion, which is basically a form of organized power. Mm hmm mm hmm Well, you can tell your father I don't live in this little apartment because I'm too lazy to get a real job. I'm far from lazy. And being poor in America is like the hardest job that there is. You see, your Aunt Tracy simply doesn't want to do anything that the overlords can turn into a revenue stream. I do lots of things. It's not my fault none of them are monetizable. Well, no, I appreciate that, honey, but you can keep your allowance. If you'd like to help your Aunt Tracy out, you could like, comment, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. No, dear, you won't get notifications unless you ring that little bell. No, I didn't get this just to ring the... Go ahead. Ring it. What's that? Of course you can tell me, sweetie. I meant what I said. There are no secrets among family members. He, he called me that, huh? Repeatedly. Well, that's my dead name, and it hurts Aunt Tracy's feelings to be called that. We never call people by their dead name. Don't tell anybody I said this, but... Where's Tracy? Your father is an insensitive hillbilly. He can go take a flying f**k and a rolling donut for all I care. I don't see know what your mother ever saw in him. Speaking of bells, are you hungry? Dinner bell. Yeah, no, your Aunt Tracy's a wonderful cook. Yeah, I'll fix you my specialty. You like Lunchables, right? I'll fix them up right away, and I'll preheat the oven, and we'll have cookies later. All right, yes, let's do it. Now, don't be mad, but I did promise your mother that I'd give you some vegetables with your dinner, so let me just dig around here until I find something, sweetie. Uh, oh, um... Do you like martini olives? Don't be scared, don't be scared, no. Just means the oven's warm enough for cookies, that's all. There, let's go pop in some cookies. Poopy. I'm sorry, sweetie, but looks like no dice on the cookies. Well, your Aunt Tracy forgot to take the dirty dishes out of the oven before she preheated them. whoops a tracy my memory is not as good as it was before we got medical in this state. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Please don't cry. Look, I'll, I'll find you something. I'll find you something. Here we go. Um, uh, biscotti? I mean, I can fix you some coffee to go with it. Regular or decaf? Okay, look, look, look. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Um, um. Oh, do you want to help Aunt Tracy with her paintings? Yeah, yeah, you do. All right, yeah, let's go paint. All right, come on, kiddo. Let's go paint. Okay, I've got you all set. You got your paint, you got your brushes ready to go. You only need just one piece of advice to start. 
first rule of painting, no matter how appealing it looks, do not eat the paint or else you'll wind up like Vinnie Van Gogh. Oh, we don't want to do that, right? All right, let's um get to work. <laughs> You might just want to turn the brush around there, sweetie. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> much better. Fingers are good. Yeah, fingers, finger painting is a thing. I use mine. Yeah, go ahead, paint your face, you know? Face painting is a legit profession. I'm sure they get paid more than your Aunt Tracy. It looks like somebody's violating the first rule of painting. Yeah, your Aunt Tracy went to art school. That's how I got my useless BFA. Now for me, it was tuition free in that I don't repay my student loans. I mean, the way I see it, they were gonna be there teaching those classes anyway. What's it hurt? Nothing. Your Aunt Tracy be happy to teach you all about art. We can maybe look at some art books later, yeah. I've got um, Renee Cox, Andre Serrano, Robert Maplethorpe, Vanessa Beecroft. Yeah, we'll have all kinds of fun. My advice, if you wanna go to art school, um, Sign up, buy all the canvas and paint you can with your student aid, and then drop out before the deadline. No, no, we don't drink this water, sweetie. This is for cleaning the brushes. I mean, a little sip never hurt anybody. Is that what your dad said? No, 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 sweetie. You can make a lot of money selling art. I know there are dozens of artists all over the world who make money. There, all done. Masterpiece. <laughs> Let's see what you have. It's so good. Honey, I love it. I do. The world needs to see this. I show it to everyone else, but I'm afraid it might violate YouTube's community guidelines. <sighs> Linda Carter makes that look so easy. Oh my, what a big yawn. Are we getting sleepy? About ready for some shut eye. Oh, I know it's scary to sleep in a new place, but don't you worry. Your Aunt Tracy won't let anything happen to you, and no one's getting in here. This place is like a fortress. Now, do me a favor and help your Aunt Tracy push the day bed against the door so I can tuck you in. Another question? Oh my, you're full of questions, aren't you? Are you a cop? I had this blind date, so I was just going to meet him at a restaurant close to my apartment. So I'm at the intersection, waiting for the light to change dressed to the nines, feeling a little bit nervous about the date when this woman approaches me. Can I ask you a question, she says. Can I have a hug? Now, I enjoy a warm hug from a stranger just as much as anybody else. This is what we call exoticization, where people treat you like they'd seen a rare bird and they just have to get a selfie with it. Well, if I'm going to be interrogated, I at least should sit down. Well, of course I'll read you a bedtime story. That's no problem. Your Aunt Tracy's full of stories. Ask anyone. Come on, let's go grab a seat. What do I do for a living? Well, I'm your Aunt Tracy. That's what I do. Do, do a lot of three and a half year olds know the word specious? Um, I'm, no, I'm impressed. Look, I get by, sweetie. I, um, I sell a few paintings here and there. Um, you know, there's the pawn shop, I uh, go to the food bank. Do I miss having a job? Sometimes, you know, I miss a few things about it, like um, like the camaraderie and the um, oh health insurance and the risk-free shoplifting. Okay, story time. Let's see. Well, let's get you a little spot on the floor. There's a nice little candle so that you're not scared. And, um, oh, here's a nice little place for you to lie down and um let me find you a um here we go here's a little blanket and um oh here's a little snuggle bear for sleepy time all right settle in kiddo and uh let me pick you out a story um mouse no um V for Vendetta, probably not. Um, a Feast for Crows. Uh, 
Oh, do you like Juno Dawson? Okay, um, let's see. Oh, well, since you're so curious about Aunt Tracy's job, would you like to hear the story about uh, when she quit? Then how about when Princess Tracy um, left the kingdom ruled by the evil ogre? Yeah, transphobic ogre. Okay, yeah, I can tell that story. Great. Um, pictures? Yeah, we can handle that. Yeah, I'll show you the picture. Sure, sure. Okay, so first let me explain where the ogre gets his power. Um, now, I learned this recently in a book I skimmed. It was a very large book, and I don't remember the name of it. But um, here's what I learned. Basically, um, oh, we'll tell a little parable. Say Beyonce has a big yellow diamond, and she wants to keep it. Now, how can she go about keeping that diamond? Well, there's three ways, basically. The first form of power is that she could use force to keep it. Like, her and Jay-Z and Kelly and Michelle could get some guns and take turns guarding it. Now, the second way is to just be so fabulous that people think she deserves the diamond and give it to her freely. Like, honestly, I think she deserves a big yellow diamond just for the Lemonade album alone. Now, the third way is the way that the ogre uses, and that would be she could hide the diamond and not tell anybody where it is. And this is called withholding information or restricting access, like I said before. So, once there was a princess, and she made a nice living as a bartender, one day she needed to see a dentist, but she just couldn't afford to go. She decided to travel to another kingdom where they provided health insurance. She didn't really want to go to this kingdom. She liked the kingdom of bars. But she made a deal in the new kingdom that if she was there 40 hours a week, they would rescue her from destitution and ensure that she could continue living. You know, it made it worth their while to keep her alive. So, at first she got to the place. There was a queen there, and she worked really hard for the queen, baking bread and um, donuts. She did such a good job making the donuts that eventually they let her move on to the clothing department, and she was in charge of all the clothes. And she just loved working in the kingdom of clothing. But then a ghost, the ghost of Sam came and took that job away. So the princess adapted. She ended up being the night manager for a while. And, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was a living, but none of the other royalty was ever around to help her. And it just got to be a drag. But the princess thought, well, if I just work hard and do good things, good things will come to me. And sure enough, the princess found an opening running the land of toys. At this point, the queen of the kingdom had moved on to another kingdom, and a great big gnome with a long, happy beard had come. When the princess discovered a gnome was becoming ruler of the kingdom, she was frightened. Not that she had any particular ill will towards gnomes in general, but this particular gnome gained sentience after a sorcerer enchanted a frat paddle. And the gnome got to be ruler of the kingdom, mostly through a golf scholarship, I believe. So the gnome and the princess worked together, and the princess was able to make the land of toys the happiest land of toys that the gnome had ever seen. The princess would have stayed in the land of toys forever. She was happy as could be. But a couple other princesses needed help back in the land of clothing. And so they asked the princess if she would come and sell women's clothing. And the princess adored women's clothing and thought, this is the job for me. And then the gnome um, got to rule another kingdom. Actually, the gnome got to rule that kingdom plus more kingdoms. You follow me so far, sweetie? Pictures? Um, so then the gnome left, and everyone wondered who would be the new ruler of the kingdom. Well, it turned out to be an ogre. Now, ogres aren't always bad people. In fact, 
Most ogres are fairly nice and don't have malicious intent at all. But some ogres, like this ogre, have a bias that they haven't really explored. And this bias is known as homophobia or transphobia, depending on the prince or princess or member of the court that the ogre rules over. Now the ogre came bearing um, a message for all of the people of the land. That message was that the ghost of Sam was coming back and he was going to take away all their jobs again. And then they would have to beg the ogre for their job back. Now the princess was always one of the favored people in the court. She had always done her work at a very high level. So she was sure she would be fine when it was time to ask the ogre for her job back. And there are a lot of other members of the court who felt the same way. The ogre knew exactly when the ghost of Sam was coming back. And the ogre also knew something that the princess didn't know, that there was no way the princess was keeping that job. As time passed, everyone was afraid of when the ghost of Sam would come back, but they had no idea when it would be. It would have been nice to know, but the ogre was afraid that if everyone knew when the ghost of Sam was coming, they would quit before the holiday shopping season. Now this is how the ogre got his power, is through Beyonce's third law of power. Do you remember what that is? That's right, withholding information and restricting access. Because you see, shortly after the ogre took over the kingdom, a terrible plague had struck the whole land. And there weren't any immunizations or anything because this was a novel sort of virus. Now, a lot of fortunate folks in the kingdom were able to stay home and not work during this plague. But the princess was not one of those people. She was forced to go out and risk her life day after day. And even though the rulers of the kingdom had asked people to stay home if they could, People just kept coming and coming. They really didn't have anywhere else to go. So it was just kind of like hanging out, you know, having something to do. The kingdom was like the, the mall. <laughs> well, the princess was scared. She was scared for her life and the lives of all her friends. Because some of the people in the land were ancient folk. And the plague was particularly difficult for them. She asked the ogre what they were going to do. The ogre assured her that everything would be fine. However... The ogre's actions did not back up his words. You see, because once upon a time, I believe it was a Thursday, the Centers for Disease Control told all the people of the kingdom that if they're going to go out in public, they should cover their mouth with a mask. Now, you would think that masks would be provided for people, but there were no masks anywhere in the land. So what is a princess to do? Luckily, the princess had a friend the Duchess of Barnes, who made her her very own magic mask, which would protect her against the evil plague that covered the land. Now, when the ogre saw that the princess had a magic mask, he made her take it off, even though the Centers for Disease Control just told everybody that if they're going in public, they shouldn't go out without their special mask. The ogre said that the kingdom would provide a mask for the princess, but when the princess asked, well, can I have one? He said, well, not yet. I said, and the princess said, well, do you really think that the virus is gonna wait around until you get some masks? The princess begged and pleaded with the ogre, why must I take off my magical protective mask? The ogre said, because my boss told me to. See, the princess had learned many years ago that if you rock the boat, nothing good will ever happen for you. But this was a matter of public safety. She felt she had to do something. So with tears in her eyes, the princess called the ethics hotline and told them what the ogre had done. Now, not only did the princess call the ethics hotline, but she also whipped out her cell phone and called half the queer community in town and had them also call the ethics hotline. Now, the nice lady who answered the phone at the ethics hotline assured the princess she would remain anonymous. But let's be honest, who else was going to call in such a complaint? You see, everyone else feared the ogre, rightfully so. What the princess didn't know at the time is that the ogre had allegiance to the ghost of Sam and the ghost of Sam alone. The ogre was dead set on retaliation. You see, the ogre 
had what's known as a male ego. A couple of days after this incident, the ghost of Sam decreed that everyone would be given a magical mask and everyone had to wear it. So the princess was never wrong. She was just ahead of the game. But the ogre's ego was bruised and, well, that's all that mattered to the ogre. Any of a rat's patooey about the rest of the people in the land? So, of course, the day finally came when the ghost of Sam took everyone's job away. One by one, the ogre called every person in the land to the office. And the princess started to grow worried because... They hadn't called her, and usually they save the difficult conversations for last. In fact, if she hadn't brought it up to the ogre, I doubt they ever would have called her into the office just to avoid the unpleasant conversation. After reminding the ogre that he had promised to meet with each and every member of the court, the ogre led her into the office. Now, she had to wait there for a little while while the Baroness of Human Resources came in. So while they waited for the Baroness, the princess didn't like sitting alone in the office with the ogre. After all, the kingdom had long had a policy against people of the opposite gender being in the office together alone. So I guess that rule was just completely ignored, even though the Baroness of Human Resources came in and should have known better. But the ogre did not believe that the princess was in fact a princess. While the princess waited, because she was kind of uncomfortable in the presence of the ogre, she decided to use the magic hand sanitizer that was on the desk. Now, way too much came out, and she really didn't need it anyway. She would wash her hands often. So she started rubbing it in instead of patting it like she normally would. The ogre, who had been waiting for a long time to prove he was smarter than the princess, was like, oh, hey, actually, you're doing that wrong. Now the princess, who still needed her health insurance, just let the ogre think that he was smart and brave because that's what you do. Because that's what you do when you're a princess and you want to keep your crown. The ogre was continuing to withhold information and wouldn't just tell the princess right then and there if she was getting the job or not. But the princess was very clever. And so she decided to probe the ogre by trying to get him off topic a little bit. You see, the ogre was feeble-minded and was very easily distracted and taken on tangents. And the princess was good at leading him down whatever path she chose. But this time, the ogre remained steadfast, which told the princess everything she needed to know. I'm not even sure if the ogre was even using his own words or if the baroness had her hand up his hind in and was working his mouth. Now, most of the members of the court were able to keep their crowns. There were only like eight or nine people who lost theirs. But of those eight or nine people, Five of them were of the LGBTQ community, two of them were African American, and there was one other person. I could be missing a person or two. It was a story from way back, you know, in um, 2020. Now the princess thought she would just bide her time because, you know, there would be a new ruler in the kingdom eventually. But then she discovered that the ogre planned on staying there until he had made three million dollars. That must, that'll take like three years probably. The princess was never going to see three million dollars in her life unless she tricked a rich prince into, into falling in love with her. And the chances of that so when the princess was called before the ogre who took away her crown, she didn't even ask him why she lost her crown. She already knew it was an inherent bias. The ogre forced the princess to leave the kingdom of clothing that she loved so much and instead had her push a giant cart around all day and fill it with food for other people in the kingdom. So much food, the princess could hardly push the cart around. And at the end of the day, the princess was not able to take home nearly as much food as she had gotten for the other people. In fact, the princess is very skinny and, um, you know, the princess is very skinny and often goes hungry. 
The princess tried to make the best of things, even though the tedium and drudgery were driving her mad. And then one day, remember the queen who ruled over the kingdom when the princess first got there? Well, she came in to do her own shopping. And when she saw the princess pushing the cart, she said, oh my, you must have given up your crown. And the princess had to say, oh no, the ogre took my crown away and didn't offer me another one. The queen almost said, you've got to be me, but she checked herself and instead said, you'd be a princess in my kingdom. Well, that was it. That was the final straw, really. And the princess realized even if she did wait it out and do a good job and get her crown back, nothing was stopping another ogre from coming along and taking it away from her again. So she decided to leave the kingdom forever and ever. But first, she wanted to switch things up and have a little fun. So the princess showed up to the kingdom four hours late one day. She walked in, she walked around, and she looked for the mean, evil, transphobic ogre. When she saw him, she said, Can I talk to you in the office and ask you a question? Once again, the ogre, who was a different gender than the princess, went into the office all alone. Now the princess could have been really mean right there and she could have said that the ogre offered her to get her crown back if she went down on him. But the princess isn't that kind of person and besides, the lawyers that work for the kingdom would have torn her to shreds. The princess has really good lawyers, but she didn't have the riches of the whole kingdom. Besides, the ogre and the ghost of Sam had put down so many decrees and rules that it wouldn't have been hard for them to go and find something that she had done and said that the princess deserved to lose her crown. The princess had a pretty good case for keeping her crown. After all, she had never had a bad performance review and had a college degree. So once the princess was alone in the office with the ogre, she thought she would just flip the power structure for a minute and tell him a long drawn out story, kind of like this one. And it went on and on. And the ogre was squirming in his chair. He literally said at one point that the anticipation was killing him. Now the princess could see why the ogre enjoyed using this power of withholding information. She didn't have wickedness in her heart, but she could see how people who did would get off on this. She played him like a fiddle. If she'd have kept going much longer, she probably could have had him playing boar on the floor. But after a bit, she got to her point and she asked him a question. And of course he said he did not remember. Now this question was something that was very important to the princess, but to the ogre, the princess was very inconsequential. But now the princess was going to make certain that the ogre was totally inconsequential in her life too. So when she got the answer she had expected, which was of course, she just got up and walked out. The ogre chased her. It was like, princess, princess, wait. But she'd already made up her mind. She didn't really have any reason to go there other than to mess with the ogre's head. And you know what happened next? Yeah, me either. That's the end of the story. I mean, oh, look, sleeping so soundly like a little Rob Van Winkle. How cute. Oh, you're still awake. Well... It's time for everyone to go to bed, whether you're an adult or a baby trans. Another story? Well, okay. Let's see what we've got. Here's a story from Aunt Tracy's favorite literary era, the Harlem Renaissance, Passing by Nella Larson. Let me read it to you. You know what? It's like 90 pages. Let me just sum up. Before I get into the story, let me give you a little bit of background. I came to this novel back in college. When I needed to fill my American Literature Gen Ed credit, there was an adorable visiting professor, a PhD candidate doing his thesis on the Harlem Renaissance, and he offered a course that would fulfill that credit, and I signed up. This is one of my favorite novels. I've read it literally dozens of times. 
Another thing I'd like to get out of the way, the concept of passing to a black woman living in the roaring 20s is obviously not a one-to-one -one correspondence to a white trans woman living today in the deploring 20s. As our story begins, we meet Irene Redfield, a Chicago native who transplanted to New York who receives a letter from a childhood acquaintance, Claire Kendry. Claire's father was a janitor who died in a bar fight when she was only 15 years old. And it seems Claire is going to be in New York for a little while and would like to meet up with Irene. So we have a little flashback to the last encounter between Irene and Claire. You see, Irene was back home visiting relatives in Chicago. And while she's sitting having her tea in a very bougie restaurant, she can't help but notice an attractive and flirtatious woman keep staring her away. Now, Irene's first thought was, oh my goodness, have I been clocked? You see, Irene was a very light-skinned black woman, and she was in a restaurant where Jim Crow laws applied. This is kind of how a lot of transgender people think of passing today, where we just go about our daily business, and if other people want to assume we're cisgender, that's on them. This was sort of a privilege that Irene had as a light-skinned black woman. You know, she would go to theater or restaurants and just letting people think what they would. This is not something that she could do if she was out with her husband, an African-American physician who was keen on traveling, but very dark-skinned. This was something that was only available to a certain fortunate few. But hey, honey, when you're not used to getting the long end of the stick, you hang on to that sucker for dear life. Now, Irene hadn't seen or even thought about Claire in a very long time. The last she had heard anything about her were rumors she heard she was out with two white guys and looking sharp. So everyone just assumed that she was a sex worker. You see, Irene and her other friends came from respectable families. They always looked down on Claire, something that Claire was obviously aware of. Claire isn't upset at all that Irene doesn't recognize her. In fact, she seemed more gratified than disappointed that she wasn't recognized. And girl, I know that feeling. I've had people that I knew for decades walk right by me in a crowd. I've talked to people thinking that they knew who I was, only to learn later. They had no idea why this strange woman was talking to them in such a familiar manner. Following the tragic death of her father, Claire was living with a couple of her aunts. A couple of very religious aunts who did not approve of anything that she did. She didn't have sweet aunts like your Aunt Tracy. So they start chatting and catching up as old friends do. While living with her aunts, Claire met a banker that she calls Jack. And Jack was her golden ticket out of the slums. We also discover that Claire's gone stealth. Stealth, of course, being a term we use today to describe someone who keeps their trans status under wraps. Irene is fascinated to hear about this, wondering how Claire was able to keep such a secret from even her husband. Fascinated though she was, Irene disapproved of Claire's lifestyle. It was abhorrent to her, plus it was dangerous. Claire's in Chicago for a month. She's staying in a nice hotel and she absolutely insists that Irene come and meet her hubby, Jack. Irene tries to make a bunch of excuses not to go. Claire is persistent, like a chaser slipping into my DMs. She won't take no for an answer. Eventually, Claire wears Irene down and she heads over to meet her at their hotel. When Irene arrives, she notices another childhood acquaintance of theirs, Gertrude, was also invited by Claire for tea. Gertrude is someone else where passing is available to her, but she's married to a white man, a butcher named Fred, and Fred is cool. Fred accepts Gertrude for who she is. But still, this is the 1920s, a time when mixed marriages were <gasps> such a scandal. As they sit there catching up, they talk about their children. You know, Gertrude and Claire relate how stressful it was being pregnant for fear that a dark-skinned child would give away their secret. This fear of being discovered is a constant stress that any transgender person who's stealth understands all too well. As the three ladies are talking about the stress they felt being pregnant while going stealth, Gertrude says, the world is so hard on us. That's why no one wants a dark-skinned child. Irene's like, um, sweetie, I have a dark-skinned little boy. Awkward. Gertrude tries to cover up her faux pas, saying, our people are way too silly about these sort of things. IMO. When she says this, I, I couldn't help but think about our community a bit. 
like the standards we try to hold one another to. We all know how unreasonable beauty standards can be damaging to our psyches. I started to feel pressure to pass. I would compare myself to other transgender women, and if, in my mind, I wasn't passing as well as they were, I considered it a failure. I got over myself. I realized that, you know, I passed as cisgender for many, many years, and it didn't lead to any sort of happiness. Of course, I was passing for the wrong gender, but... Oobla dee oobla da. See, while a lot of transgender people have very good reasons for passing, personal safety, access to resources, better treatment, it's just not available to many of us, most of us probably. Not all of us can be wealthy Olympic athletes or even dentist-rich YouTubers. Me in the face. You know, when I first started my transition, I had a very good attitude. I felt like, you know what, I'll probably never pass as a woman, but as long as I live as a woman, I don't really care what other people think. But then as I started to hang out with other transgender folks, and the hormones started to do their thing, I started to desire passing. Desire it as a goal. I started to feel really bad when I felt that I didn't pass. Anytime someone misgendered me, I took it very hard. And I always blamed myself. I was sure it was my fault. I'd say things like, well, I'm not wearing this outfit again. Well, things are about to get awkwarder. Hubby Jack is home. He walks in the door, sees the three ladies there, looks right at his darling wife, and calls her a racial pejorative directly to her face. Now what are we to make of this? Has he discovered that Claire has been stealth all these years? No. This is his idea of a joke. Because Claire tans so easily, he thinks it's humorous to call her this terrible name. See, Jack is a full-on racist, 100% white supremacist. Hearing the explanation of why Jack chose such a pet name for his darling wife, everyone burst into laughter, Irene laughing maybe a little bit too hard. <laughs> this situation reminds me of my days in the closet, sitting there in a dark theater surrounded by uproarious laughter as a pet detective discovers a police lieutenant as a transgender woman. <laughs> Not funny. But just like I sat there and took it for fear of being discovered, Irene sat there and took it. Irene was done with Claire forever. She wouldn't kick her in the cup if she had a spider on her shoe. Here she sits holding a letter with a postmark letting her know that Claire's in New York City and would like to get together. Irene is still furious at Claire for not warning about her husband's intolerance. Understandably so. Like, why on earth would Claire do such a thing? Was she trying to show off how passable she was? Was she trying to get discovered? Did she want out of the relationship? Did she just think it was a grand joke? So now she's not returning any of Claire's phone calls. She's not corresponding with her at all. As I said before, she wants nothing to do with her. So of course, Claire just drops by for an unannounced visit. Claire's been oh so lonely. You know, in her situation, she's been robbed of her sense of belonging. It might be nice to have a sugar daddy and all for a while, but still you have to put up with them. Now, Irene has been organizing a benefit dance. It's in Harlem, but when Claire discovers that a lot of white men are there to, um, to try and hook up with a black woman. Remember exoticization? Yeah, big time. Claire invites herself to the dance, thinking maybe she can meet up with a new sugar daddy. Irene says, no, you can't come. It's too risky. She pulls a, think of the children. What would they do if you were discovered? But Claire's made her mind up, and she comes along. Now let's talk a little bit about Brian. Brian being Irene's husband. I would not call their relationship a healthy one. Irene is extremely codependent and tries to manipulate and control Brian. As I said, Brian liked to travel, but Irene thought he belonged in New York City with her and the children and did everything she could to prevent him from leaving. Well, since Claire has been coming over to their place, Brian has grown moody and distant. I wonder what that's all about. Look, it doesn't take a pet detective to figure out that Claire's been putting moves on Brian and that Brian and Claire got a little something something going on the side. Irene's in denial about this for as long as she can be. She just can't allow the possibility that her husband has somehow escaped her control and is cheating on her with Claire of all people, whose father was merely a janitor after all. 
So they're having a party and she sees Claire flirting with Brian and the realization that her suspicions are true hits her like a ton of bricks and she drops the teacup that she's holding, shattering it everywhere. To cover up the reason why she was so shook, she tells everyone she broke the cup on purpose, that she'd always hated the thing, and it just occurred to her today that if she smashed it, she'd be rid of it forever. Cut to, Irene is doing a bit of shopping with her friend Felice, another African-American woman, but someone who is obviously African-American, not light-skinned and passable like Irene is. Once again, keep in mind, passing isn't available to everybody. It's kind of a privilege. A privilege that's sometimes necessary for transgender people, but a privilege none the same. So Irene and Felice are on their shopping trip, and who do they run into? But racist Jack himself. At this moment, Jack discovers that Irene is not a white woman like he'd assumed. Nevertheless, he holds out his hand in a greeting, but Irene snubs him. Good for you, Irene. Good for you. But now she has a dilemma. What is she going to do? Is she going to tell Claire that she ran into Jack or is she going to keep it a secret? Like what would happen to Claire and her family if her husband found out? Think of the children. So later on, Irene is getting ready to go to a party with Brian at Felice's place. While she's getting ready, who happens to drop by? You guessed it. It's Claire. Irene straight up asks Claire, what would you do if Jack found out about you? And Claire says... I'd finally be free. It would be the best possible outcome, don't you think? So they all ride together and they head up to Felice's apartment, which is in the penthouse of a six-story walk-up. Everyone's paying plenty of attention to Claire and this burns Irene up. She opens the window to have a cigarette when who should come bursting through the door but Jack. Jack's there and Jack knows the whole thing. Jack's there to confront Claire. And this, my little friend, is where I leave it because the end of the story is too good. I can't give it away. Read it for yourself. My trans status is not what we call a secret. In fact, I probably bring it up more often than I should. I'll tell you exactly when I gave up on passing. When in the same day, I had somebody assume I was a cisgender woman and asked me out on a date, only to cancel when he found out that I was trans. It's actually kind of a funny story, but we'll tell that story another day. This video is long enough. And then later that day, another guy hit on me. He said he saw me riding my scooter and he knew I was a transgender woman. I was wearing my motorcycle helmet at the time, face fully covered. <laughs> and that was the day I saw the complete futility in my attempts to control whether I passed or not. I thought about why am I trying to pass in the first place? Do I want to be a cisgender woman? Should I? You know, today I am so happy being who I am. I'm transgender and I'm proud of it. Transgender people are beautiful. Trans bodies are beautiful. Now, if you have to go stealth in order to protect yourself or just because you think you can and it would make you happy, by all means, do what makes you happy. Do the thing that leads to fulfillment in your life. I think a lot of people think passing is the goal for every transgender person. It's not in my case. I mean, if people want to assume I'm cisgender, that's their business. But I'm just trying to look pretty. Transgender people are too often portrayed as duplicitous people who are trying to trick people. They were trying to pull the wool over somebody's eyes. This couldn't be further from the truth. What we're actually doing is trying to share our genuine selves with the world. And that's a beautiful thing. You know, passing can make your life easier. If you're able to pass, you can avoid a lot of awkward questions, a lot of bigotry, a lot of uncomfortable situations. You know, I think about some of my friends in the community, particularly my LGB friends. Sometimes they'll invite me to a place and they'll tell me, oh, it's very accepting, very inclusive, only to get there and find not so much. The thing is, unless they're holding hands with their significant other or wearing a pride t-shirt, there's nothing that communicates to the world their sexual identity. They're kind of like Jean Grey and Emma Frost. Unless they show their powers, no one would ever clock them as homo superior. Sometimes I think of myself like Mystique, able to pass, but only with concentration and effort. But no, that's not accurate. I'm more like Rogue. I can't control it. 
See, when we talk about passing, we're talking about other people's perception of you. And honey, don't, don't even bother. You'd be much happier if you realize that you can't control that. Besides, nobody cares what cisgender people think. I certainly don't. Sorry to break it to you. I've talked to some transgender ladies and they feel their happiness is contingent on their ability to pass. They just don't feel that they'll ever be complete if they can't afford expensive surgeries. Now these surgeries, these procedures, these are medically necessary, but unfortunately they're not available to all of us. I want to share with you a tweet now from comic book creator Magdalene Visaggio. I just want to tell you, yes you, that you're a worthwhile person and the people who love you are not wrong to do so. You are unique and irreplaceable. The universe will never get another chance at you. Hey, what are you doing up? I thought I'd put you to bed already. What have you got there? What What do you have in your mouth this time? Um, let's not tell your mother about this, okay? Must that kid put everything in their mouth? Come on, let's go back to bed. You take too much after your Aunt Tracy. Continuity errors? No, those are Easter eggs. Oh yeah, she came and picked the little tyke up this morning. Oh, we had a great time. I wish I could have kids. I still haven't had my first period. Oh, wait, I got a call on the other line. Hold on. Bonjour, Tracy Parlant. Oh, hi, sis. Oh, you know, just a little bit of housework. Then, you know, regular routine. How is the little tyke? Well, nightmares? Well, probably just something, you know, that they ate. Oh, yeah, no, we, we, we had veggies. I don't know, probably Harry Potter. Well, who knows where kids hear these things? A rolling donut, huh? I mean, probably, you know, the playground. Well, yeah, keep me in mind. <laughs> Bye.